lecture is uh, something that's actually really important. Uh, this, is, this is the way you actually want to build a modern database system. Last year when I taught this lecture, I actually put it at the very beginning. This was like the third lecture because uh, in the older system, this we had this, you know, the, the compilation stuff was the, the major direction we wanted to go, and it was the new part of the system that I wanted to teach everyone so they understood it, so that going forward in all their projects, that you know, they, they knew how to use it. Uh, this is at the end for this semester because, as you saw from, from one of the, the project groups, our system doesn't have an execution engine yet, so we don't have any of this code generation compilation stuff. They're working on that now. So, uh, and so with the exception of that one group, nobody else is, is, is touching this stuff. So it makes sense to put it back here in, at the end. I think next year I'll put it back in, in the front. Because again, I know that when, when people watch these lectures on YouTube, they watch maybe the first four. So they go through like, you know, a little bit about multi-version concurrent control, but then everyone drops off after that. Whereas like this is super important and this should be in the front, but for your guys' purposes, since it didn't matter for the projects, I put it at the end. Um, all right, so today's, today we're gonna talk about code generation query compilation. So first we need some background about why you want to do this. And then we'll talk about the two main techniques, uh, transpilation or code generation, source, source to source compilation, and then JIT compilation. And then we'll spend some time talking about um, how some actually real world systems do this. And as I said, if you're building a new system today, you want to do the, the things that we're talking about in this lecture. Right? The, the performance difference is quite significant. Uh, and then we'll finish up discussing uh, what's going to be expected to you or general tips for doing the, the Project 2 code reviews that I'll start on, on Monday. Okay? All right, so the sort of the motive why we want to do uh, code generation or co compilation um, is comes with this nice little snippet from uh, the Hecaton guys. So when they started building Hecaton, they were trying to figure out, all right, if we put everything in memory, how can we get this thing to run faster and the, the, the system run faster? And at the end of the day, it really comes down to be being, you know, trying to execute fewer instructions. Right, we're going to talk about you know, how to execute more instructions per cycle. Those are some things we talked about before and we'll talk about going forward. But you just say, just in terms of like doing less work, to do, doing less instructions to, to compute the same amount of data uh, is our target, then how, how much faster can we actually get? So, they did a little napkin ca calculation that said, if you want to get 10x faster, then you need to execute 90 fewer instructions, right? That's, that, that's feasible, it's not, it's not easy, but that's, that's possible, right? But if you want to go 100x faster, then we need, we need to execute 99% fewer instructions. Now that gets to be super hard, right? That's not just you know, turning on 0100 in GCC to start printing things, right? There's, there's, that doesn't exist. Um, so this is a good example, of, like, again, like we can try to execute few instructions, but there's a sort of a, there's an upper bound or lower bound how much actually less work we can actually do. So we're gonna care about other things. And this is, this is where caring about the instructions per cycle can, well, is, is, gonna, is gonna matter a lot. So the way we're going to do this, so we talked about some before, some, some techniques, and we did, we talked about joins, some techniques to, to do less work on the Freud stuff, we talked about, you know, uh, not having to evoke the function and, and, and sort of doing a bunch of optimizations by putting everything into relation algebra. So in our role, what we're gonna talk about today is, to, is what's called code specialization. And the idea here is that rather than have the database system have this general purpose engine that interprets the query plan and at runtimes figures out you know, what the data looks like, what the operation is trying to do, we're actually going to bake or generate on the fly code, now, it, could, it could be either machine code or like source code, like C, C++. We're going to generate on the, that on the fly for the query we're trying to execute, then compile that, and then now we don't have any branches, we don't have any uh, interpretation of what the query plan is trying to do. We now have sort of, sort of a hard-coded, baked machine code that only executes that one query, that's specialized to execute that one query. Right? And now we can, we're going to execute fewer instructions, and we're going to also end up uh, being more clever about our algorithms and get uh, you know, more instructions per cycle. Right? So we can try to achieve that 100x speed up that the Hecaton guys were, were trying, to, trying, to, trying to get at. So the biggest bottleneck is going to be is that, for I'm going to say traditional databases, but the way people normally 
implemented databases, you write it in a way that makes the, that the source code is maintainable by humans. Right? You try to make it be, you know, do good software engineering practices so that a human can read it and understand what's actually going on in case they need to modify or debug it. But in many cases, the way you organize code for humans is not actually the best way to organize code for modern CPUs. And the compiler, whether it's Clang or GCC or whatever you're using, is not going to be able to magically make that uh, become optimal. So we can sort of organize our, 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 our specialized codes that we're generating for our queries in such a way that may not be easy for humans to read, but actually is the best way to do this uh, in our hardware. So to give it a quick example of what kind of things we're going to do, I want to use a really simple database here. Three tables, A, B, and C. Um, and A and B have primary keys, and C just has a foreign key references to both of these guys. Right? So we'll just use this going forward and a bunch of examples. So first thing we want to talk about is, again, what are existing systems doing? Right? Or if you're not doing code specialization, you're not doing uh, compilation, what, you're doing interpretation. So what does that look like? So we have this query, right? and it's a, it's a, it has a nested, nested uh, aggregation, and then it joins that with A and B. So the, the query plan essentially looks like this. And as we saw before, when we actually talked about the processing models, the way we're actually going to implement this using the iterate approach Going from the top to the bottom is calling next, 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 going down, right, one at a time, and then pushing tuples, tuples up, right? So this sucks, right, because what's going on here? So every time I call next, what is that? That's a function call. That's now a jump to some other address space in our process. Then we have to set up the stack, pass, you know, pass along registers, and evoke that. And then when we do a return or do an emit, we're sending data back up, and then now we're, we're you know, popping off the stack and going back down to where our function was before. Right? When we actually evaluate these predicates, we'll see in the next slide, this is really inefficient too. So I'm going over every single tuple, and you know, in this case here, I'm doing the filter on uh, you know, b.val equals question mark plus one. Right? I have to invoke that for every single tuple that I'm evaluating. I have to do that addition uh, to, to, you know, on, on, that, on the tuple's attribute, and then check to see whether that equals what, I, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm looking for. Right? And it's, if you remember also when I showed that example of the Postgres numeric code, it had that giant switch statement that said, uh, you know, if you're trying to add a negative numeric plus a positive numeric, do this. If there are two negatives, do that. Right? All that is being invoked for every single tuple as you go along because this code is set up not to know anything about what the data is that you're looking at. Right? So there's nothing in here that's baked in about what the schema is. It just says, oh, I'm looking at a tuple. I know what offset maybe I want to look at in my predicate. And then I do my, my comparison on that. And then return true or return the tuple up based on what I'm doing. So there's all these giant switch statements all over the place that says, oh, the tuple you're trying to operate on, the, the value you're trying to operate on is this type, and you're trying to do this kind of comparison with this other type of value. Here's how to actually do it. And that's really slow. And you saw this when you read the, the X100 paper from, from MoneyDB. If you remember them talking about uh, why MySQL was slow, it's all that interpretation because the query plan does not, is not baked into what the data actually looks like. So we see this also problem now too with predicates, same thing. I, I, sort, of, I sort of mentioned this before, but let's actually see what's going on. So let's say I just want to do this one simple here. b.val equals question mark, and this is, this is if you have a prepared statement, right? this, is a, this is a placeholder value, a placeholder where you can stick a value in at runtime. So you, when you invoke the prepared statement, you say parameter one equals one, two, three, and then they substitute that, that in. So if I want to evaluate this, right, the way it's organized is through an expression tree. Right? So you have the equal clause, and then it has a left child and a right child, and on one side you have the, the lookup for the tuple attribute, and the other side you have the addition where you take the parameter you're passed in and the constant. So when I want to evaluate this on a per tuple basis, I'm going to pass in a bunch of execution contacts about what tuple I'm looking at and what invo you know, what's the invocation of this query. Right? So I have, like in this case here, to do this thing to look up and say what's b.val, I look up in my contacts and say, well, I'm looking at this current tuple here for this table, and I know that b.val is at some offset based on its table schema over there. So then you know how to jump. You, you do the lookup and say, I want b.val. b.val is the, the, the second attribute. The one prior to this is 32 bits, so I know I want to jump over 32 bits to find in the tuple that I'm looking for the value that I want. And then it says, all right, well, the schema says it's an integer, so I know I should be passing up an integer here into my equal clause. 
Now I go down, the, all right, and then output a thousand. Now I go down the other side, same thing. I want parameter zero. So now I go look up my 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 array of parameters that I get invoked when I invoke the query, and, and I want the offset zero. So that gives me 99. I know that's an integer, so I pass that up to this addition. This guy says it's a constant one, so that's just one. It goes up here. And now I'm doing interpretation to say my left side is an integer, my right side is an integer. Now I'll do an addition for two integer values. And then produce an output that then gets shoved up here. And now I do my comparison. I have an integer on this side. I have an integer add up on this side. I, now I can do a comparison of those guys. So again, it's just these giant switch statements that says I know what my, my, uh, I know what my left child type looks like and my right child look, type looks like. How do I do addition on them? Because right? what would happen if this would be a float and this was an integer? Right? You, wouldn't, you need to produce a float, not an integer. Right? So again, this is being implemented by switch statements. So now, this is really expensive. I'm doing this for every single tuple I'm looking at. So if I have a, if I have a billion tuples, if I, have, if I organize my expressions as a tree, I'm traversing this tree, again, which are function calls, and jumps to these different regions of memory to do some kind of trivial computation to then emit the value back up. Right? And we do this because these expression trees can, can, uh, can represent any possible predicate we could have in our query. Right? So it's a general purpose representation. But it's expensive. This is, e again, easy for us as humans to reason about, difficult to run fast because of the function calls and indirection. So this is what, again, code specialization is going to do for us, is that we're, we're going to take any kind of computation we're doing over and over and over again in our database system, and we're going to generate code that is specific to execute that, that code, or act, you know, that, at that operation. So that could either be the predicates I just showed in the last, last slide, it could be the operator execution when I show the entire query plan, like you know, computing the join, right? But there's other parts of the system, like doing the scans, the store procedure stuff. We talked a little about this with Freud. So instead of taking the UDF and, and converting it into uh, relational algebra and shoving it to the query plan to do query rewriting, if I can't do that, then I can, I can actually then compile the, you know, the if clauses and the, and the T SQL or the PL SQL code and invoke that as, as native machine code. For logging operations, this is mostly a bottleneck or mostly an issue for doing uh, replay on replication. So I'm sending over log records. Instead of having to deinterpret the log records, I can compile specific code that knows how to apply the updates very efficiently. So again, that, that's the goal of this. The idea is that we're going to do some same operation over and over again. And we want to be able to generate machine code specific to that operation because that's going to be way faster than doing any interpretation. So that means that we don't do any lookups and say, what, is, what type of data am I looking at? How big is it? What kind of operation I'm doing? How do I handle negatives and, and positive numbers put together? I bake that all that in directly into machine code, and that's going to be way faster. So again, the, the reason why we can do this is because we know a bunch of stuff ahead of time. Right? This is, this is, in a relational database, you call create table. You tell the, the data system, my table is going to look like this. And it doesn't let you store anything in a column. If your column's integer, it won't let you store something that's a float or a, you know, a varchar. It'll throw an error. So that means we know exactly the data type of every attribute that we're looking at. So that means when we look at our predicate, and our predicate says we want the, 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 the second attribute in my tuple, and then this constant parameter here, and I want to add them together, I don't have to do any lookups and say, well, what's the type of this? I can bake that in my, in my specialized code, my, my, you know, my generated code, exactly to do that operation, and that, that's going to be way faster. So again, we know all the attribute types ahead of time, so we can avoid all the, the function calls to do excess stuff, right? Uh, we know all the predicates ahead of time, so we know how, what, what they're going to be looking at, so we can, we can generate efficient machine code for that. And then when we do our operator execution, or even actually in the predicate evaluation, we can basically inline everything, as, or at least as much as possible, so that we don't have any, any function calls. So we're just ripping through machine code that's, it's, it won't always be branchless, but ideally, yes, it will be. Uh, we just rip through, uh, you know, sequential code, and that's the fastest way for the CPU to execute it, right? Because remember we talked about in these superscalar architectures, they have these long pipelines, and we just want to keep feeding that thing instructions and have all the data that it needs in, in its caches so that we never have any memory stalls or we don't have any branch mispredictions where we have, to, we have to flush out our pipeline and jump to some other space. We just keep giving instructions and let the CPU run, you know, almost full speed. So that's the goal. All right, so how does this work? How, what does this look like in our, in, our, in our database system? So this is a rough overview of where this, this all everything we're going to talk about works, works today. 
So the application sends us a SQL query. We first go through the parser. The parser will give back, get back an abstract syntax tree. This is just saying here's the tokens that, that are in, in, in your SQL query. Right? But it hasn't mapped anything to the, the table objects or the column names. It hasn't mapped them to anything. That's what the binder does. The binder then does a lookup in the catalog and says, I see a query on table foo. It comes back with either like a pointer to table foo or an, or an object ID for table foo. And then I annotate my AST. AST. Then I send this along to my query optimizer, who's going to crunch on it and try to find an optimal query plan. And then it spits out a physical plan. So the physical plan is uh, saying, I want to do a hash join on these tables and reading these indexes with these predicates. It's like, it's like the thing you would actually interpret if you didn't have this compilation stuff we're talking about. Okay? So then, with this physical plan, we feed that to the compiler or the code generator, and it's going to do something. We'll explain what that is in a second. And it's going to spit out native code that we can then execute as if like we're invoking something from the command line, like an executable. Right? The way we're really going to do it is, is generate a shared object link that into our program, and then invoke the entry point for that shared object to invoke whatever it is that it actually does. Right, so we, it's not like we're, we're generating native code as a, as a standalone binary and then you know, fork executing it on the side. We're going to run this in our, in our address space uh, for, our, for our database system. And it's not a security issue because, again, we're the ones actually generating this code. So we're not worried about you know, someone else sending us malicious stuff that then trashes our system or, or reads something they shouldn't be reading. This is code that we're generating, so therefore it's safe to run this in our, in our own address space. And it's not for, you, for store procedures in UDS, if you let people run arbitrary languages uh, that, are, that are not safe, like C, then you, you, don't, you don't let that, them run UDS in the same address space. You run them in a sandbox. But again, we don't have to do that because we're, we're running query code here. All right. so. The two approaches to do this. The first is called transpilation or source to source compilation and then JIT compilation. And a high level, again, the, at the end of the day, they're, they're going to produce the same result. You're going to end up with, for, a, for your query plan, you're going to end up with machine code that's hard coded or baked or specialized for your one query. Just how they go about it is slightly different. So with transpilation, you're going to have code that generates, you have code that generates code that gets compiled. So you're going to have like C++ code or Python code, whatever you want, takes in your query plan, and then it, it spits out a source code file of more C++ code. And then you run that through a compiler, and then, and then that generates the machine code. The second approach is JIT compilation, and this is where you're going to generate an intermediate representation, IR, uh, think of like Java bytecode, same thing, and for the JVM. So you're gonna, you're gonna go from the source code and generate, sorry, you're gonna go from your query plan and generate this, this IR directly. Then you feed that into your compiler and then that, that generates the machine code. So, so semantically, you know, certain, again, it's at a high level, they're doing the same thing. You're going from a query plan to machine code. It's just what are the, the intermediate steps uh, in between them, okay? So we'll, again, we'll, we'll go through each of these. So for the first one, transpilation or, uh, or source of source compilation, uh, there was a system out of University of Edinburgh uh, about a decade ago called Haiku. And again, this was one of the first prototypes in academia, at least in the modern era, uh, that would take, again, a query plan, generate C code, and then they would actually fork GCC, run the source code through that, and then GCC would spit out a shared object, and they link that back into their, to their database program, and then that runs the query, right? So for this one, again, they were just using an off-the-shelf compiler, uh, you pay a penalty for, for forking, obviously, um, and it seems like a, you know seems like it'd be a bad thing to do. We'll see one simple one system at the end, uh, commercial system actually did it the way Haiku did it. I think this is the wrong way to do it because um, again, the, the exec part is super expensive, um, and there's a bunch of stuff you have to set up in your in your in your query. Uh, sorry, in, in your in your code you're generating that you may not have to do if you're going to the to the JIT compilation approach or having a an intermediate step in, before you do this. But let's look at, uh, at a high level what it's doing. So say we have our query here, select star from A, where A.val equals question mark plus one. So the, the interpretive plan would essentially just do this. So you, you grab some handle to a tuple, or sorry, a table, and you're just gonna iterate over every single tuple in your, in your table. And then for every tuple to go grab it, the way you have to do this is you go get the schema from the catalog for that table, which you do once and then cache it, so that's not that big of a deal. But then, assuming that we're in memory, 
we got to go figure out that we want to, you know, for some offset that we want in our table, we then know how to jump into memory to find that tuple that we want. And then we return a pointer back here so into our code that we can actually end up using. So this one here, it's, it, this one we can cache is not big of a deal. But this is basically, again, looking up to see, doing some simple arithmetic to figure out where we want to go, and then finding that pointer and bringing it back. So the most extensive part probably is the jump to code call this function, right? And then now for every single tuple we get back, then we want to evaluate this predicate. We have to traverse that tree that I showed in the beginning, where you go down and, and sort of evaluate each, each operator, and you start pushing things up into the plan, uh, into the, to the expression tree, till you get your final output to tell you whether the, that tuple has, has been, uh, was, was satisfies your predicate or not. And again, as you're going along, you're casting the comparison operators based on what the, the predicate actually wants and what the tuple is actually looking like, right? And then you return true or false. So the way you, in Haiku, in Haiku, what they would do is they would have these templated query plans like this, or source code, where you would have all the things that we were computing on the fly over here, like the tuple size, the predicate offset, and the parameter value that I want. And you just fill in these values. So then now, when you actually invoke this, uh, the compiler is basically just going to insert these constants in here uh, so that you don't have to do a lookup, and it's super fast. And then when you actually do your comparison here, now, again, instead of calling a, an evaluator function for the predicate, I'm baked in directly in my if clause, right? If val from the, from the tuple that I extracted, if, it's, if it, the parameter value plus one equals this, then I know I, I want to emit it. So again, there's, there's, there's still indirection because I have this if clause to decide whether I want to emit this or not. We talked about how to do a branchless version of this, but everything's still the same. But the main thing is that I didn't have to go any function call. I didn't have to reverse a tree. I didn't have to, to, to interpret any aspect of the query plan. This thing is baked to do exactly what that query wanted to do. And that's going to be you know, so much faster. Right? So the nice thing about this also, too, is that since this case here, this, you know, this is pseudo Python code, but like they're going to be generating C, C++ code. And so that means that since the, if the rest of the system is implemented in the same language uh, and, and is in the same runtime, then our, our generated query code can, can invoke any other aspect of our database system that we've, we've implemented uh, you know, as in, in C++. So that means that like, in, in my templated code that I'm generating, if I need to make calls to the transaction manager or the log manager or other aspects of the system, I can just bake that into this stuff here. Right? There's no, there's no sort of specialized bridge I need to have between this stuff and the, the rest of the database system. So that's actually really nice because again, you, you can implement all those other things um, uh, in C++ in, without doing this code gen stuff and test that just as if it was you know, a regular database system. But then when you run the query, right, it's just making calls to those functions as, it would, as if you were running the interpretive plan. So that makes the integration of... Uh, of, of other parts of the system with code generated or, 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 you know, or on the fly generated source code for your queries, all that sort of integrates seamlessly. Now in the case of the LLVM stuff, uh, we, we, don't, we don't have this problem anymore, but in the, in the old system, there was a bunch of macros we, we'd have to have to allow you to call from the LLVM IR call into uh, C++ code. You had to sort of mangle the, the, the names of the objects and functions. So a bunch of tricks we had to do to make all that work. Um, it wasn't as seamless as, as the way that, that they're describing here. And then now with the way we're doing this in the new DSL, which I'll talk a little bit at the end, um, you can still do this, but again, we, we sort of it's hidden from you as the, from the rest of the programmers. Right? We're, like there's some extra stuff you have to do before you can call C++ code for the LLVM stuff, whereas this one just calls it natively, just as, as if it was running a, a regular function. Okay. So let's look at evaluation from the Haiku guys, because this is, this, is, this is a good, um, it clearly shows the benefit you're going to get and what kind of performance you know, improvement you're going to get from doing, uh, from, from doing this code generation. So what I like about this paper is they, they basically implemented like all different variations of, of ways you could, could do query execution, and they put it all in, in a single system. So it's like, it's like a real Apple, Apple comparison. So the first is that they're going to have what they call a generic iterator. So this would be like, you know, in an introduction database class, the way someone would implement, uh, you know, a really simple iterator scan over a table. Um, 
But then they have optimized versions where they inline all the predicates, and then they had uh, sort of they had a type specific iterators for for every possible column type you could have. So they would have an iterator go over integers, an iterator to go over over floats, right? Where in this one it was it was generic, and you, you know you have the switch statement to say to interpret for every single tuple that you look at what the type actually is. Then they had a hard coded version that was. Uh, Again, using sort of generic pattern, but this was like hard coded C++ code written by a grad student. Then they had an optimized version that did direct tuple access because the types are baked in. Now this will end up be the way Vectorwise or X100 does. We'll show at the end, end, of, this, in the end of the class. But just as a, as, a, as a spoiler or a precursor to say this is coming later, the, what they're describing here is actually the way Vectorwise does it. And then they have the HiQ, which is doing the query specific specialized code. Again, they're, they have C++ code, generate C++ code, and then they compile that and link it in. All right, so in here, again, the, the, it's a, the, the paper's from 10 years ago, so the machine's a core 2 duo, which is pretty old by, by today's standards, but again, the, the, the relative difference in performance is still valid. So again, the, the, with no surprise, the optimized hard code version and HiQ actually do the best. And it's, it's very small, but the HiQ version is actually slightly better. And again, because they organize the source code in a way that's more efficient for the CPU, whereas th this is written by a human, and is done in a way that the human, you know, could could reason about. So this is showing that it's like you know the the data system can be a little bit smarter than what a human can do uh, in organizing the code that it's emitting to get better performance. And of course, any, everything else is you know, as expected. Like the generic is the worst. Uh, you know, the iterators and interpreting t interpretation is always really bad. And then as you get toward this side, if you get more specialized, you get much better performance. Right. So um, the, the main thing also, another thing to point out here too is like the, this thing has huge memory stalls because of the indirection, because of, again, you're doing this interpretation to look up and say what, what kind of type of data I'm looking at. Um, but down here they have almost zero mem memory stalls, right? So that, that's super impressive. Um, I think they also measure L1 cache misses here and I'm, I'm not showing it uh, because the number is just so small, right? It, it wasn't even worth plotting, right? All right, so then the other thing now we, we talk about is how long it takes to compile this thing, right? Because that's the biggest issue, right? So going back here, right? So, so in this case here for, for these TPCH query, or, or doing a join um, on a rather small table, uh, you know, high Q is, is 50 milliseconds. That's pretty good, right? But the problem is it's going to take you over 100 milliseconds to actually compile it. So the compilation time is taking longer than the query time, right? So that sucks. So in this experiment here, what they're doing is they're going to show what the performance is or the, the, the compilation cost is for running with O0 and O2. Uh, I don't, they didn't report O3. As far as I know, when people ship database system software, if you don't care about like trying to recreate, recreate a crash or you know, care about passing along debug symbols, you, you ship software with O3 because um, the difference is, 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 is worth that. Um, it's, it's worth using O3. So again, no surprise, O0 is basically, it's no, no optimization passes, but even then it takes 100, uh, 100 milliseconds to, to, to compile Q1, which is pretty simple. There's no join in it. Um, and then do, doing with O2 takes, takes twice the amount of time, or, or even more in some cases. Um, so again, this sucks, because if my, so say even like really simple queries, if my query is gonna run for five milliseconds, but it takes me 100 milliseconds to compile it, then, the benefit of compilation is basically out the door, all right? Um, and the reason why it's going so slow, because again, they're fork executing GCC. So think about what that does when you do it from the command line, right? It reads in the config file, it parses in some command line parameters, loads in the file you want to compile, and then it emits the binary, right? So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of setup involved in making that call that you know, is not directly related to the compilation calls. Like this has no optimization passes and it still took a, a lot of time. So again, this is this is this this, you know, this is bad. We, we this is what we want to try to avoid. Um, so there's other aspects about why the the haiku one doesn't work as well. And the the I mean the compilation stuff is unavoidable. We know about this because we're forecasting like GCC. But the in terms of a performance of the actual query plan they're generating anyway, the way they sort of set up. The, the system to emit the source code is that 
they're not allowing for full pipelining. Meaning they're still kind of doing that tuple at a time iterator approach that we showed at the very beginning where like, and they're not making function calls every single time because everything's in line, but they're still sort of operating one tuple at a time per operator and then moving things up uh, step by step. So if we want to do pipelining, we, this is actually something, again, a, by, we can organize our pipelines in such a way that's ideal for our, our CPU. It, it's going to generate really ugly code, but who cares because people aren't, shouldn't be dug, debugging our you know, auto-generated code anyway. And this is something that us as the database developers have to deal with, but it's not like the, the, our customers have to do this. So we can be a little bit smarter about how we organize the, the source code we're generating to take advantage of full pipelining. So remember what I said before, a pipeline is basically a, a segment of the query plan where we can keep operating on, the, on a single tuple uh, for as far, far up in the query plan as we can go. And then there'll be, there'll be there's what is called a pipeline breaker, is where we can't, keep, can't proceed in the query plan for a tuple until we get all the tuples below it, or all the tuples for that pipeline. So going back to our, our, our simple join query like this, so these are the, the four pipeline boundaries we could have. Right? And the, the easiest one to reason about, again, what a pipeline is, is, is number two down here. So I'm computing an aggregation uh, on, on the counts for, for the, the BID. So I can scan over B, I can iterate over B, do the filter, and then start computing some of the, 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 the count here to build my hash table, but I can't actually proceed into the next pipeline until this thing actually completes. Right? So, I, so I, I, I do one tuple, add it to my, my hash table for this, but then I gotta come back and get the next tuple. I can't keep going up in the, into the query plan. Right? Same thing for this side here. I can do my filter uh, on A, put it to my hash table that I need for my join, but I can't compute that join until I finish computing my hash table and then compute, compute the probe side. S this pipeline over here, I can scan on C, do the join with the hash table I built over here from this pipeline, and then after, if a tuple, if a tuple gets satisfied in the join predicate, then it moves up to the next pipeline, or ne the next join operator, and I've already built my hash join from this pipeline, so then now I can just do the join right there and then emit it going further. So in this case here, I can take a single tuple, I can go from the scan on C, this join to this join, and then produce the output without ever having to go back to the next tuple. That, that's why this is called a pipeline. So in Hyper, the paper you guys read, they're gonna to try to take advantage of these pipelines and try to, again to keep tuples in registers, CPU registers, for as long as possible going up in this pipeline. Right, so again, it's, it's, they're, they're, it's different than the iterator model where you're sort of going, grabbing a tuple, maybe doing something on it and going back and get the next one, right, before you go back and, and give data back up to your, uh, your, your, your parent operator. So using the syntax that we talked about before when we talked about query processing, so they're going to be doing a push-based model instead of a pull-based model. So they're pushing data up rather from, you know, from the bottom to the top, rather than pulling it from the top down, right? Uh, and then they're doing what's called data-centric versus operator-centric. This basically means that like, they're going to keep their tuples for as long as they can in, in the CPU registers and in our pipeline, uh, rather than sort of think about how to organize the, 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 the source code they're generating based on you know, what operators we're invoking. So it's, it's, it's more revolves around how we're organizing the, the system to operate date tuples rather than how to execute these operators. So the hyper paper you guys read is from 2011. And so this was the, again, part of the modern era of doing uh, query compilation. This was the first paper that came out and says, here's how to do this in the LLVM. So they're, they're going to be doing JIT compilation. So in the paper you guys read, they had this appendix that had all this IR stuff. I hope you didn't read it because I can't read it. It doesn't matter. Uh, but that's just showing you what, like, they're, they're going to have C++ code that invokes some macros that generates that IR directly, and then they pass that IR to LLVM, which then compiles it. So they're not doing the source-to-source -source, uh, conversion. They're just going directly to IR and then compiling that. So there's no sort of intermediate step. So this paper is crazy, right? It's, uh, it's written by one dude, Thomas Neumann. So he's a professor. Like, like uh, so the professor wrote 80% of Hyper and then wrote that paper by himself and got it, got it published. And this is like a, a very highly cited paper that everyone follows. But this is crazy. Like, again, he's like maybe my age. Uh, he has PhD students. He has to teach two classes a semester. He's got three kids. I have zero. He doesn't have a dog. Like, he has, 
he has way more going on in his life, and he wrote 80% of their system. And then, I can say this publicly, it hasn't been announced yet, they've already, got, you know, Hyper got bought by Tableau, so like half his students went to go build a, the, the, the commercial version of Hyper for Tableau. He's already building the new one, right? And the new one already supports all the TPCH and most of TPCDS, right? And we, kept, we haven't done anything yet. It's just like, <laughs> he's one dude. And he doesn't think. I don't like, what the hell is he doing? Sorry. <laughs> LLVM. So, uh, uh, actually, who here ha has not heard of LLVM before this, this lecture, before this paper? Okay, that's fine. Um, so, it's a really interesting project. It came out of UIUC, uh, uh, University of Illinois, and they were trying to build a replacement compiler for Clang. And then what they ended up building was this toolkit of a bunch of, like, uh, uh, components you need to do for, for, for compilers. And the idea is that they, they have this IR that they've generated, again, very similar to the JVM's, uh, you know, the JVM's bytecode. And it's meant to be this sort of universal IR that you can then build a bunch of front ends for to take any possible query language and have it turn into that IR. So you can take Scala, you take a C++, or whatever you have, or Python, and that can then generate that IR. And they have a bunch of, bunch of backends that can then take that IR and compile it to whatever architecture you want to target. So x86 and ARM or power or whatever, right? Um, so that's, I mean, that's actually really kind of cool. And so there's a lot of, uh, since then, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's gone beyond the university. Um, and I think Apple's invested heavily in this as well. Um, and they're funding a lot of the development. Um, so, you know, so, so we can leverage this to run this, basically do the same thing that they were using to, for GCC for. We can run this inside of our same address space for our database system, feed in, IR, or whatever we want to generate, have it do the compilation and, and, and generate the shared object directly in memory. And then now we have an address to that shared object, which we can then invoke. Right? We don't have to link anything dynamically, like in the case the Haiku guys have to do. So again, the main thing to understand about this, just like in, in the case of Haiku, where we can have the code regenerate, call other parts of our system that are written in C or C++, we don't have to implement our entire database system in LLM IR. Uh, we can have you know, a little macro magic. We can have the LLM IR stuff invoke our existing C++ code. So that's why, in the case for you guys working on our system today, the execution engine we're building out with the LLVM, it's not anywhere in the repository, but everything we're implementing is in C++, because once we have that execution engine in place, it can then invoke your C++ code, just as if it, just as if it was written in C++, even though it's written in this LLVM stuff. Right? So... The, all right, so I don't, I don't go into details of exactly how the, the, the IR stuff works from Hyper. I want to talk about how they're going to do the push-based uh, execution. So again, this is basically the kind of code they're going to generate. Uh, this is, they'll generate this in IR, and then they send that to LLVM and compile this. And it's, now you can see it's sort of organized in these pipelines. So in the, pipe, the first pipeline one, we scan on A, uh, we do our filter, and then we uh, materialize it in our hash table to, to, you know, to start on the build side. So you can see that one, we're taking a single tuple and we're iterating, uh, or iterating every single tuple in A and we're going up as far as we can in the pipeline before we move on to the next one. So once we've done completed this pipeline, then we jump to the next pipeline and do the same thing. And then we do it with the three, and now four here you see, we have three nested for loops because we're iterating over every single tuple in C and then we're doing our join uh, in B and every tuple comes out of that, then we do our join on A, right? So. Again, the idea here is that for a single tuple that we have coming out of the bottom of our pipeline, we go as far as we can up into, in, into the tree. And we, they try to keep everything in CPU registers, like they can control this with, with LLM and IR, and, they, and, they, and that's going get, to get us the best performance. All right. So let's see what, see what they can actually do in terms of, uh, for runtime code. So this is running on TPCH. I actually forget the, the size of the table. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know how big this is, but they're going to take Hyper with the LLVM approach. Hyper, which did the same thing Haiku did, was generating C++ code and compiling that. Vectorwise, which does the pre-compile primitives, which I, I'll show in a, in a second. MoneyDB, which does, uh, they have an interpreter on opcodes, which looks like SQLite, which I'll, I, can, I can talk a little about it as well. And then the, the question mark one is just Oracle, right? <laughs> uh, so again, for all of these, the hyper LLVM version uh, does the best, I think, 
vector wise, except for this last one here, they actually match what, what vector wise can do. Um, which again, I'll, you'll see why in a second. Because uh, they're basically just operating at bare metal speed for the machine code. Like the, the primitives, you, the, instead of generating code on, on the fly, vector wise precompiles all possible types of code you could need and then just stitches them together at runtime. Right? So that's why they're, they're able to match the performance. Um, I forget why they said the, the, hype, the C++ version of Hyper doesn't do as well. I think it's because they switch over to the more aggressive pipelining approach than in the LLVM stuff. Right? Yes? Um, why does uh, vector-wise not exist for Q3? I think it just crashed. I think that, that's what it said. Yeah. Um, and this is back in 2011, so vector-wise, at that point, vector-wise was like three or four years old. It wasn't, I don't think it was in, in commercial use at that point. Um, okay, so performance looks good, but what was my main complaint about Haiku? Haiku was getting good performance too, but what was the main problem? Compilation, right? So how does this compare to Haiku stuff? So this is not a true apples to apples comparison because uh, I'm taking the, da the, the data from the, the, the Haiku paper and the data from the Hyper paper, and since they're compiling the same TPCH queries and the same data size, you know, it's not on the same hardware, but you need to get a relative idea of what the performance difference is. And as you can see, you know, the, the hyper guys are down in like, you know, uh, you know tens of, of milliseconds, like 13 milliseconds and, and so forth for these queries. Whereas like in Haiku with O2, right, you're, you're up to 200, 400, or 600. And again, because you're not forking GCC, like LLVM is optimized to run everything in memory and do your compilation. Uh, there's no setup cost for that. So, so that's why these compilation t times are so low. They're executing the same queries. It's just the, you know, there's no parsing overhead of the of the C++. You just going, you know, or parsing of the config file. You're just going directly from L from, from the IR into machine code. So that's why they get that lower time. So this seems like this solves all our problems, right? Like, of course we want to do this, right? Well, for these simple queries in TPCH, yeah, th these compilation times are are, are small but not all queries in the real world are gonna be as, as simple as TPCH. You know, even though it's a benchmark that's, that's supposed to be representative of what real world, real world look, look, workloads look like, real world queries, um, that is the case, but there are still queries that are more complex than this that people wanna run all the time, right? So the issue is gonna be with LLVM is that the way to think about how they're organizing the program, uh, the, the, the IR, there's, they're, like, they're generating one giant function Right, They're like the entire query plan is going to be baked into this this you know this IR uh, that they and then pass that to the to the to the, the compiler. So what's going to happen though is that now, according to the hyper guys, the compilation time is going to grow super linearly relative to uh, the complexity of the query. So in the real world, queries can get quite large. So uh, I always say this, but I, my friends at Google told me that sometimes they see queries in their database systems that are like 10 megabytes in size. So that doesn't mean they're operating on 10 megabytes of data. I mean, the SQL query itself is 10 megabytes. Because what's happening is people have all these dashboards or analytical tools where they cl click a bunch of checkboxes, you know, like you know, filter things on state, zip code, or other, other features. And so you, they, they have these things that can generate a bunch of pre-filled um, uh, uh, you know, definitions of these predicates that can then essentially be these giant in clauses or complex case statements that'll, that'll turn the, qu the query to be really, really large. So now you throw this into our optimizer and then the optimizer spits out a query plan that's really big, we throw that through the LLVM and the compilation time is gonna be huge. So in the case of Hyper, they told me that uh, when they were sort of preparing Hyper, you know, whether or not this was for the acquisition, before the acquisition to, by Tableau, they, they were doing the same thing that we try to do, or we're trying to do, of, of mimicking the Postgres catalogs and speaking the Postgres wire protocol. So now you can connect to it with a bunch of Postgres tools and get the same you know, management benefits that you get from you know, if you ran regular Postgres. So they attach PG Admin, which is the, so the web tool to do administrative stuff with Postgres. Like, and when you turn on PG Admin and you first connect to the database, they invoke a bunch of queries in the catalog to figure out what tables do you have, what databases you have, what, what the attributes look like. And they told me that like when they first turned it on, these queries weren't that complex, but the, the compilation time was in like you know the one second range. 
So that means you turn on PG Admin, and it took like two, two or three seconds for the thing to actually like come, come up and say, here's your database. Whereas if you ran with regular Postgres, it'd be instantaneous, because these queries would be so fast. So this is going to be a problem for, in OLAP queries. It's not going to be a problem for OTP queries. And I'm going to take a guess why. So yes. So, so there's two aspects. He says first is the simplicity of them. What's the other aspect of this? It mostly just like update a single attribute. No, but like nah, it's a, the query doesn't know that. If I if you have an update statement, like the, the the compiler doesn't know you're updating a billion tuples versus one tuple. The query is the same. In OLTP applications, they're executing the same queries over and over again. So we can cache all the shit we talked about, right? So we can like. If it's a prepared statement, we just cache the query plan and we and then we fill in that the the type at runtime, right? Or we say we we know the type that for the the placeholder value needs to be an integer. So if someone passes us a string, maybe we we cast that once before we we fill it in to our to our our query plan, All right? So for OLAP applications, it's not a big deal because we we can we can cache everything and the queries are real simple. For OLAP queries, this is more problematic. And then the, the PG admin or the Google example is, is the two ones that uh, I gave. So the hyper guys came up with an interesting solution to this. And so what they came up with was is what they're calling adaptive execution. And this was published in ICDE last year. Uh, and this actually won best paper at this conference. Um, I, I think I think it's a really good idea. So what they're going to do is they're going to go through the same step they did before. You take your query plan, you run some macros that spits out LLVM IR. And then now what you're going to do is you're going to take that LLVM IR, you're still going to compile it, but you're, you're, you're not going to wait for that compilation to finish before you start executing the query. You're instead going to have an interpreter for that IR that then knows how to execute the query based on that IR. And then when the compilation is done uh, and you have the binary, you slide that in uh, into into your, your query execution, and then and then the rest of the executors just use that. So again, remember the morsel stuff. The morsels was organizing the tables into blocks, and every single time that that a worker says, "All right, I'm done with this task. I've finished this morsel," it goes back and tries to get another morsel. So now you just have a flag somewhere that says, "All right, well the compilation for this query has not finished, so the interpreted engine can just keep crunching on it." And then at some point, when I finish the morsel and I look and that flag is set to true, I know I don't want to keep interpreting. I go get the compiled version from some location and run that, and that'll run much faster. Right? So it sort of looks like this. So again, the SQL query shows up. We run that through an optimizer, and these are Hyper's numbers. So that takes about 0.2 milliseconds. Then we run it through our code generator, and that takes about uh, 0.7 milliseconds. All right, so then now here we're going to fork off into three, three ways. So we take our LMIR. And then we have a bytecode uh, compiler that's going to just turn this IR into bytecode that we can interpret. Right? We actually tried this ourselves, and we, we instead of actually doing this little, you know, this lightweight compilation step to turn it into bytecodes, we actually built our own IR interpreter directly for LLVM. All right. Then we have a a uh, in another thread we'll run through the unoptimized version of the LLVM compiler. So think of this as like doing O zero in. Uh, in, 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 in GCC, and then that spits out x86 machine code, which then replaces the, the, the byte code we, we're, we're interpreting. But then also in the background, we're running the, the, the more expensive LLM compilation or optimization passes and the optimization LLM compiler. So now you're at 25 milliseconds plus 17 milliseconds, and then this then produces the, the fast machine code, and that replaces everything else. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't report numbers, but the... Um, I think this was like you know, it's like two x faster going down for each of these, right? It, it, it's quite significant. So now this solves all our problems that we talked about. The first problem I said was the large Google code, right? That takes a long time to compile. Uh, so I can still make forward progress on this by up in here, while in the background this thing you know can crunch me for a second. So if it's a, if it's a really long query, all right, if the query is going to take you know ten milliseconds, or sorry, ten seconds, then I can still make forward progress. And then this thing takes a second, and then, and then I can, for the remaining nine seconds, I can, I can use the faster version. In the case of the PG admin query, it's actually really simple. The query is going to be really, sh uh, really uh, short. So maybe I only get to this thing here, and then maybe you know it's it's two x slower than the uh, than what we would do in a regular interpreted engine, but it's not the you know the ten x slower that it was in the compilation version. And then of course also I can cache that query plan so that if I come back and connect to it again, if I had the query plan around. 
as a compiled version around, I can reuse that. All right? Yes? This requires that you have something like morsel, right? Otherwise, yeah. you wouldn't have to handle it. Yeah, so his statement is this requires you to have morsels. Cause, yes, cause, cause in order to handle this, because the morsels provide you a natural sort of stopping point to check to see whether any of these compilation stages has finished. Because otherwise, if everyone's just kind of going on you know, full blast, you have to somehow interject, hey, stop running. Right? Because again, the whole point of this is I don't want to throw away any of the work I've already done. Because this is, right, just because this is interpretive, this is compiled, the, the, the answer is still going to be correct because it's all coming from the same query plan. So to tell you how we did it in, in the old Peloton code, we actually couldn't do any of this because we had either, we had two separate code paths. We had one for the interpreted engine and one for the LLM engine. And they did not know about each other. They couldn't talk to each other. It was even worse than that. They had different semantics. So they actually, depending on whether you went from one down one code path versus another code path, you could end up with, with slightly different query results. Right? When this one here, everybody's operating on the same IR that comes out of this thing here. So as long as your interpreter of the IR is, is correct, right? Meaning it's going to execute the, the, the it's not, it may not execute the instructions in the same order as this one, but that's okay. The, the high level meaning or the high level semantics of what's actually being executed will still be the same. So the, I think this is the right way to do it. Yes? Are there any situations where like even the code generation stuff is not worth it and the old like naive iterator model is better? So his, his question is, are there any cases where this compilation stuff is not worth it and you're better off using like the this intermediate interpreter or the old old interpreter. Even yeah, even even like more stupid than that. Like even where this code generation, even where like turning it into LLVM at all is just not worth. Like taking this query plan and actually interpreting it. Sure, sure. Like like the, the, the old style. Um, key value stores, right? Get key, put key, delete key, right? There, there's no query plan. But that's super simple, right? And in, most key value stores are looking at opaque blobs like it just it's just my byte my, my key is a bunch of bytes my string my value is a bunch of bytes so there's no real query plan there um i you know i, I actually if you're doing anything beyond simple key key value store i can't think of anything you'd want to do this the again the the, the thing i want to stress about this and we'll see this in in the newer system that we're doing now and in mm sql like again it's all operating on the same ir so like it's it's not like I have to have two, two separate code paths. Like I like if I'm building a system today and I want to do complex queries, I want to do I want to do this approach. I don't want to have like you know an interpreted engine and an LLVM engine and then decide at runtime which one to use. You just you go go, go either one. And if you again, if you have any kind of query plan and you have any kind of uh, if you're allowing users to define the data you're storing, that's going to require interpretation and that's where this thing uh, will always be the the interpreted model. Okay, so I want to talk about now some real-world implementations. Uh, again, we <laughs> we got to pick a name this month, right? Because I think uh, two students are writing master theses, and we're trying to submit papers in this, and we can't call it, you know, we can't call it. <laughs> we can't call it. <laughs> right? We got to think of something. Um, where it's, the original name of the system was. <laughs> right. I, so we're trying to think of two one-syllable words to put together, like Postgres, Click House. That only means our database system. So my wife and I were like, were like you're joking. I'm like, oh, we can come up with like that's stupid enough and it's unique enough. Um, we actually, I think for the intro class, we, we, for that database we build in, in four, 15, 445, we might call that just to mess with people. Anyway, we got, we, so we got to think of a name this month. This is on me, not you. All right, so let's go through a bunch of examples and see how they're doing uh, uh, query compilation in different ways. So, as in many cases in databases, what seems like novel and new, and I, that's why I was sort of uh, um, qualifying what I was saying before about like, oh, in the modern era, Haiku was the first one that did source-to-source -source compilation, and Hyper was the first one to do JIT compilation. The reason why I'm saying the modern era is because back in the 1970s, IBM did it first, right? So when they start, first started building System R, as I said, they got a bunch of people that had, a bunch, they had brand new PhDs, put them in a room, says, let's build a database system off of, off of Ted Codd's paper, and everyone picked their own little piece. One person went, went off and did SQL, another person went off and did query optimization, somebody went off and did query compilation. Right? And the idea, again, was that for a query shows up, they were going to generate assembly code uh, by sort of doing what Haiku was doing, was selecting the operator, these templated operators that they didn't fill in the parameters at runtime, 
And then they, then they just invoke that. So it had a big performance benefit, but the software engineering cost was really bad. Uh, and because every single time you change like the, the, the header of, of a tuple or the layout of data, you had to go back and change all of your, uh, your, you know, your, 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 your templates. So you know, if one team made a modification, that would break everything in the, in the query compiler. So when they went IBM, uh, you know, they, they never commercialized system R, but then when they built the first commercial version of, of a relational database, DB2, in the early 1980s, they brought over some pieces of system R. They didn't bring it over this. They abandoned it because of that software engineering ad. The other issue, too, also was back, in, you know, back then, x86 wasn't as dominant as it was now. So IBM had all these different ISAs for all these different mainframes they, they had to support. So you had to have, you know, if you want to have a data system run on these different systems, and you wanted to do this, this code generation, since they were emitting direct assembly directly, you had to have that, you know, you have to have support every single kind of assembly as ISA for all architectures that they already, they already had. So again, this is why nobody did that, you know, nobody did this in the 1980s or 90s or 2000s, really only in, in, in the modern era that people actually do this now, because of all the problems that IBM had. And, they, and there's these great, um, there's these great papers, uh, this one's called the History and Evaluation of System R. They have had a bunch of interviews with the System R developers in the, in the early 1990s, and they talk about all the problems they had trying to build the system, and this, this thing comes up as being like a big <laughs> So Oracle, uh, at least in the, like the, the, you know, the Oracle database system, like when you, when you download it for your laptop or, or you get the, you know, through RDS on Amazon, like the, the, not Exadata, not Rack, not the specialized Oracles, like Oracle Oracle, uh, doesn't do any code generation or query compilation stuff that, that, that we're talking about here. I think they might do uh, compilation for uh, predicates, uh, but I, I, I haven't verified that. The only kind of true sort of, you know, end-to-end uh, -end compilation that they'll do is for stored procedures. So for stored procedures, they'll convert the PL SQL, which is supposed to be based on, on the SQL standard. Um, they convert this into their own proprietary language called ProStar C or ProC. Right, and then they have a compiler that to, to, to compile into native code that can run inside the system. And the reason why they're doing this this transformation to pro, proceed is because they do a bunch of checks to make sure you're like you're not violating memory constraints, you're not reading something that you shouldn't be reading. So sort of they have an intermediate security check. The one thing that Oracle does that nobody else does, which is crazy, is that they say Fuck all you know compiler stuff. Let's just bake this in the hardware, right? Because they bought Sun I don't know ten years ago. And so some was, you know, developing Spark chips. So in the last five years, Oracle will now sell you newer Spark chips that actually have Oracle database operations directly in, ex in, in, in silicon. So like for like compression and security stuff and vectorization, like there's stuff they're adding specific to Oracle's chips that Oracle's database system can actually use and, and go faster. So that's, this is even better than compilation, right? Because this is like avoiding any, any, you know, this is avoiding general instructions at all. You just go directly to the hardware and, and do stuff very quickly. Um, of course, this is not cheap. You pay a lot of money for this. I can't say anything anymore. <laughs> okay. Uh, for Hecaton, they, uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure this made it into the commercial version. I know at least the academic version could do this. Um, they could compile both the store procedures and the SQL. And what's really kind of cool about this is that they had these, with Hecaton, the idea was you declare a table as being in memory, and you could have your regular SQL Server tables. And then the way they would speed up access, like if you wanted to join the, 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 the in-memory table in Hecaton versus the regular table in, in, in SQL Server, they would sort of pre-compile these, these conduits or these, these inner operators that allow you to, to, to do the joins or get data from one side to the next very efficiently. Right? So that's another good example of like specialization is not just for a single query plan. There's a bunch of stuff you can, you can set up ahead of time to, you know, based on the schema that's defined for the table to allow you to move data around or, or process data more quickly. So the way they were doing this, they were doing the haiku way, where they would generate C code uh, and, uh, from the, the query plan, compile that in the CLR with a D, or the DL, into, with, I guess their, their compiler, and generate a DL and, and link it at runtime. Um, there's a, another system they have um, that does sort of streaming analytics that does the same thing. Um, so the, you know, the high queue approach is very common, at least in all the, uh, the Microsoft systems that, that I'm aware about. All right, Impala is a uh, SQL engine built on top of HDFS or the Hadoop file system. So they're going to use LLVM JIT compilation, um, and I think they're generating the IR directly. 
Um, they're only going to do this, though, for predicate evaluation and for processing uh, files. So the idea is that there's no, and Polly doesn't have its own uh, proprietary data format. Like, like think of like Oracle, MySQL, SQLite, they have their own proprietary you know, file formats and that they know how to read and re read and write data from. In Impala, they want to operate in the Hadoop ecosystem or on the cloud. So people are generating you know, CSV files or JSON files or Parquet files in all these different formats. So they want to be able to process things very, very efficiently. So they'll pre-compile the, the code to actually parse these files because you have to tell it, hey, my CSV looks like this. Right, so they have a, a, a fast compilation method to go read that data very quickly, and then for the predicates as well, they're doing the they're, they're doing the the compilation. Right. So again, this is another example of not just taking query plans, doing other more low level things. Uh, you can you can do that do that better with compilation. Uh, Actium vector we've already talked about last year. I said they were dead, and then they emailed me and complained and said they're not dead. Uh, and again, this this is this is the commercial version of, of vector wise. So what they're doing is that instead of Instead of, uh, instead of for every single query plan, either generating on the fly the IR or the C++ code and then compiling that, the database developers, the acting or the, the vector-wise developers themselves, they're going to predefine a bunch of primitives for all the different ways you could you could you, you could access uh, data in a query, right? So like think of like there's like hundreds of these primitives for you know for every single data type for every single operator you want to do on them, and then when at runtime they figure out what primitives they need to stitch together to then produce the result for the query that you're trying to execute here, right? So these primitives look like this. So say we have here, we have two scan operators on, on a column, and you see that we're passing in, like, you know, is something less than something? So this is, this is the less than a 32-bit value, and this is the less than a 64-bit uh, double. So this is the code that'll get compiled when the system gets compiled. So then at runtime, I look at my query. I, my query is trying to do a lookup on this column. Oh, this column's a double, and my, and my scan operator is doing is something less than something, right? So then now I just pass in here a pointer to my column and the, the value I want to do comparison against, and then I just, I just invoke this thing here, right? And that's the same thing what the code generation guys are doing. They're generating code that looks a lot like this, just now we're, we're pre-baking or, or pre-generating things you know, ahead of time. And, that, and I showed in that one slide, they're getting just as good performance as, as Hyper in many cases. And for us, it took, it took us a while to actually be, be able to beat vectorwise uh, in, in, our, in our own system. Right? Because again, there was a bunch of hardware tricks we had to do to go faster than, than this. So this is just another way to think about doing code generation. Like, instead of actually doing it on the fly, you can do it at the very beginning and just stitch these things together. And you end up getting uh, pretty close results. And the paper you guys will read uh, two weeks from now, uh, we'll, we'll compare the vectorized approach versus the hyper approach in a little bit more detail. Also in the context of vectorized execution. All right. Um, actually, yeah, so real quick, I'll say also too, for this one here. Um, in this case here, like we'll talk, you'll, you'll learn about, you'll more about vectorization next class, so the SIMD stuff. So the compiler, in, if, this is, if it's smart enough or you, or you provide it with enough pragma hints, the compiler can recognize here that I'm doing iteration over a column, and therefore I can might, and I'm just doing like a, a simple comparison operator here. It might be able to convert this into SIMD code automatically for you. So this is where the vector comes in, a, in the vector-wise name. The, the goal is that by, by writing code in this way, where you're doing these simple primitives, the compiler can be smart enough and recognize that this, this little kernel, this part of the, of the query, the for loop, can be vectorized, and it, it'll unroll it for you automatically. Right? So again, we'll, we'll cover that. Uh, We'll cover that in more detail next week. All right, for MemSQL, MemSQL actually did it in two ways. The first way they implemented this was, was in Haiku, uh, the Haiku way where you, you generate C++ code and then fork is like GCC. And the reason why they did it this way is because one of the, the, one of the founders of MemSQL was at Microsoft uh, when they were building the Hecaton project. So he saw some of the early talks from Hecaton people. He wasn't working on the project, he was just there. They had these internal talks about Hecaton, and they talked about how Hecaton was going to do the source-to-source -source, uh, transpilation approach. So when they went off and, and built MemSQL, they, they brought along that same idea. So the problem, though, again, is that the compilation time was super high. Haiku was an academic system, so they didn't have to worry about people getting pissed off that their query you know, was taking super long because they had to compile. In a real system, people notice these kind of things. 
So the way the MemSQL guys would get around this is that the first time the query shows up, they would extract out all the, the constants from it and turn it into a parameterized, essentially a, a prepared statement automatically. And then you fork exec and compile that, and then you cache that query plan. So then now the next time you see the same query, or the query with the same structure, just with different constants, you would, could reuse the compile plan that you had before. Right, so again, so select start from A, where AID equals one, two, three. I can extract out the one, two, three, compile this, and cache it. So then if I come along with where AID equals four, five, six, I extract that, you know, extract out four, five, six, recognize I had this pattern, this query from before, I can reuse that plan. So in the early days of MemSQL, when you read their documentation, they would talk about, you know, they were very explicit about this, and they would give examples and say, look, you run your query, the first time it's going to take one second, because we're, we're doing this compilation, then the second time you execute it, it's going to take you know, 0, 0.0 seconds because we're, you know, we're, we're, re -able to re -able, we're able to reuse the, the, the query plan. So we asked them about this. The, 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 the parameterization and the, the matching was really simplistic. It was, like, it was just exact string matching. So if I had something like you know, where a.id equals something and b.id equals something, if I came back now with another query with, with those predicates reversed, like b.id first and then a.id second, it couldn't semantically recognize that they're the same. It would just say the strings didn't match and it would always have to recompile. Right, so it was a really simple technique they were using. So then after 2016, uh, MemSQL got a lot of money uh, and they hired the guy out of Facebook that built the hip hop VM. Right, so P, uh, Facebook you know, famously runs on, on PHP and the PHP uh, interpreter is slow. So they, they built their own, you know, essentially their own JVM for, for PHP. And so they hired the guy that sort of led that project to come, come along and re-architect the entire you know, the system of MemSQL. And what they're, what they're doing is actually, the, which I think is the best way to do this, and what we're doing now in our own system, is that instead of going directly from the query plan to C++ and, and compiling that, and also instead of going from the query plan to IR and compiling that, they're going to have an intermediate language, a, 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 a DSL, domain-specific language. So they're going to convert the query plan into this C-like dialect that they call the MemSQL programming language, MPL. And then from there, they're going to generate opcodes. Uh, and then they have an interpreter for that opcodes. But then they can also compile that, convert those opcodes into IR, then compile that. So you may, sound like, you may say, this sounds like a lot of steps. Why do I want to do this? Well, the thing that we haven't talked about the biggest problem with the LLVM stuff that the hyper guys do is that when you crash, you land in assembly, right? You don't have a backtrace to figure out what the hell is going on. And you have no way to recognize that like, oh, I'm, I'm crashed in this assembly. Here's, here's the pointer to the source code that, that generated that IR that caused me to crash, right? It's a lot of trial and error to figure this out. And this is, this is you know, in, in, in our own system, we only had maybe two or three students that actually could operate on, to actually work on our, our, on our engine. Everyone else would, would cry or give up or whatever, right? I'm not saying, I'm not, you know, I'm saying I, I'm not one of them. I, you know, took, I couldn't figure it out. Um, it's hard. So what this allows you to do by having this DSL and having this way to interpret it, now you can hire your, your I don't want to say your less, your, your less gifted developers, but the, the people that aren't working on the IR stuff, they can operate directly on this, and they can now debug this, because look, again, it looks like C, or C++, and you can run it through the interpreter and step through and say, well, what's actually going on? And with little debugging tricks, you can, you can then have GDB set up and say, all right, well, here's, here's some hints about where in the source code that, that we actually generated the code, your opcodes you're, you're actually looking at. So they told me, and I, I think they're absolutely right, is that it's way easier to hire people to operate on this stuff rather than have people operate directly on the, on the, on the LVM IR, right? So there's, sort of, there's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, actually, I don't know what the performance penalty is. I mean, obviously, there's going to be some performance penalty, but I don't think it's that major, because you're not doing optimization passes. You're just doing this, this transformation. So it's almost like the same penalty you would pay from going from SQL to our query plan, or AST, right? So I think this, in my, my opinion, as of 2016, this is the state-of-the-art way to, to do code generation. This is the right way to do it. Right? And it kind of is a combination of everything, right? It's, we're, doing, we're doing transpilation or source-to-source -source source compilation because we're taking a query plan, generating this intermediate DSL, and then we're taking that DSL and then converting it to, uh, to the IR, doing JET stuff. All right, to, uh, three more to finish up with. Uh, Batiste DB, 
Oh, no, it's Vitisa DB. There's Vitis DB. That's the MySQL stuff from, from, use, uh, from YouTube. The Vitisa DB is the a query accelerator for Postgres and Greenplum. And they actually borrow a lot of the ideas from, from, from the hyper guys. So they're doing the, the push based processing model. They're combining with LVM IR direct, directly. Right. And they're, they're, you, they're, they're avoiding all indirect indirection by inlining or having direct calls for everything. Right. So for this one, what's really interesting is that they're hooked into Postgres and Greenplum is based on Postgres. So it works the same way. And basically your query shows up. They look at it and figure out, is this something we can compile? Yes or no. If, if, if no, like if it's an update, then they go through the regular Postgres path. If yes, then they go to the compilation path and then they know how to operate directly on the Postgres native data. So it's not like you have two different databases running. It's all the same underlying uh, data structures and storage. It's just how you get at it, uh, depending whether you know, it, it can be compiled or not, uh, will vary. And this is actually a pretty good link. Uh, it's a few years old now from one of the founders of, of the company. It's like a, at a Postgres conference. He basically goes through all the things we talked about today, and, sh and, and plus vectorization, and talks about how they can make Postgres run faster. Um, they back then also too they could do uh, they could do uh, inter query parallelism. Like they, they could, for a single query, you can run it multiple cores. This is back from the day when Postgres couldn't do that. Postgres actually does much better at this now. Postgres supports parallel queries. Uh, MySQL does not. Apache Spark does this for their uh, for expression trees. So they had this thing called Tungsten Engine that came out in 2015. So the way this works is that uh, in Spark, everything is written in Scala. And so there's some uh, trick you can do in Scala to have it generate uh, you know, JVM bytecode directly. So they're sort of doing the, uh, the, the same kind of JIT stuff that Hyper does, but instead of generating IR, for generating uh, JVM bytecode. All right, so then we get to us. So, the, in, the, in the original version of the system, we were, we were entirely interpreted. And this is because we built the system not for this, this, we sort of built the first system to do some non-volatile memory stuff and not directly this, uh, the, you know, the compilation stuff or the, the self-driving stuff we're doing now. So, we had the, the old interpreted engine, and then my student Prashant, my PhD student Prashant, built out a new uh, LLVM engine. And the goal eventually was to throw away all the interpreted stuff and just keep the compiled engine. Um, of course, that, that caused a bunch of problems as we were going along because we essentially had two code paths to execute queries, and we would get different results, and you wouldn't, you, it wasn't clear whether you were going down one path versus another. So the way in, in the LM code he, he implemented, he was doing the hyperstyle full compilation of the entire query plan. We were having the C++ code generate the IR directly and then compile that. We didn't do the adaptive execution stuff that the hyper guys did. Um, we did have a, a visiting student build an IR interpreter, but we never integrated that into the full system. So we eventually wanted to do the sort of the staging that the hyper does, but we just never got there. The thing though that's going to make uh, what we were doing that was significant over what hyper was doing uh, is that we were actually going to relax some of the pipelines uh, to create these little mini batches going from one pipeline to the next. And the way we would hide the memory stalls is actually use software prefetching. So Hyper wasn't doing vectorized execution. So they would take a single tuple and they would, they would sort of go along up, you know, up the pipeline as much as possible. But if you want to do vectorized execution, that doesn't work because you need to get a batch of tuples and then put them in your SIMD registers, then fire off the instructions to execute that. But then that sucks now because now, like, I, I, instead of taking the same query, the same tuple, and writing up the registers as much as possible, I'm going back now in my loop and going to get more tuples. And I can have a memory stall for that. So we would do software prefetching which we would, we would give hints to the, to the CPU and say, hey, we're going to loop back around and get, the, you know, look at this next tuple, so go ahead and prefetch it and put it into our caches. And we would hide our memory stalls. So we have one, uh, one graph here that shows you the benefit of doing this, 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 uh, th these prefetching, and we'll, we'll cover this uh, in the next lecture. So the gray bar here, this is the old engine. I'm just showing you here to show how retarded it was, right? Uh, so you know, this is what? This is... Yeah, it's 100 times slower. Uh, this is not, I don't, I don't want you to get the idea that going from interpretation to compilation will get you 100x. This is like if you're retarded to not retarded, it gets you 100x, right? Um, the real number is maybe like 50, 20 to 50x, all right? Okay, so the, the LLM is also going to give you a huge benefit, but in some cases for some queries, you can squeak out another 20% or so by doing this, uh, by doing vectorization and doing uh, doing the, the, the software prefetching.
So again, we'll, we will cover a paper that, that compares the trade-offs between compilation and vectorization in two weeks. This is one example of actually trying to combine the both of them. Vector-wise is sort of doing this, you know, predefined compilation and, and vectorization. Hyper was doing on-the-fly compilation. Our approach is trying to do both, right? On-the-fly compilation with vectorization. All right, so now, this is 2017. Now what are we doing in 2019? And this is gonna explain what the, uh, that one team is doing for the project. So we're gonna do mem SQL style conversion to go from the query plan to a, uh, a database oriented domain specific language. Currently it's called the coming language. Uh, but again, the name will change. So then we take that DSL and then we, then we convert that to opcodes. Then we have an interpreter for those opcodes that can then again execute in the same way uh, that the, the, the hyper guys were doing, right? While we compile in the background. Then at some point the compilation will, will finish and then we can slide in our new, uh, our, our, our compiled version. So the difference between here versus what the, the, the hyper guys are doing, the hyper guys are taking the LLM IR and interpreting that. We're generating intermediate line, or, uh, the opcodes that the many of the MemSQL guys are doing and interpreting that. Right, so because that way, again, that's even, I think even easier for, for humans to read because if you look at the appendix of the paper you guys were required to read, that's all you know, mumbo jumbo unless you know LLM IR. These opcodes are a bit, bit easier to understand. Like, they're like human readable. So again, so today we have a query plan. We, we generate something in our DSL. So this is what the language looks like. Right? It looks like something that looks like C or, or Python. Right? This, this, is, this is readable. And then we convert this into opcodes, which looks something like this. The name doesn't matter, but like what they're actually doing. But again, I can read this. You know, jump if false, uh, 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 table vector iterator, right? These are all things that like someone stepping through the code can then figure out what the hell's actually going on. So then we take this, these opcodes, have an interpreter to give, again, interpret these things step by step manually. Then in the background, we also then compile it. And when this is ready, we slide in our compiled machine code to replace the one up there, right? So this is the future. This is what that team is help helping my PhD student, Prashant, build. And then, you know, coming in the fall, we'll, ha we'll have this fully integrated. So now we, we will, we'll be able to execute in the end SQL. Um, and, you know, if you make a mistake in the code that generates uh, the, 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 the DSL here, you can figure out actually what caused the error and, and, and lead you back to where that was located. All right, that's the goal, that's what, that's what, that's what we want to do. All right, uh, we're well over time. Um, I'm going to spend, maybe, actually, maybe since we're out of time, maybe I'll cover the code review stuff on, uh, at the end of class on, on, on Monday, right? We'll do, the, we'll do the reviews and then we'll do a quick like, hey, here's what you need to do for the, for the, for the code reviews. I'll also post that, you know, this guideline as well on, on the internet. Okay. So, the query compilation stuff, again, the reason why I pushed this lecture in the beginning last year, because I think this is super important. Right? This is hard, this is why they pay database developers a lot of money, but this is what you wanna do to get the best performance now on, on today's systems. And if you're, if you're building a system from scratch, you wanna be doing something like this. So, and again, I've already said this, but the, 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 the way MemSQL does it now is the best way to implement this. I think you get the most benefit of a performance and the best benefit for software engineering. Right, Haiku gives you the best engineering uh, benefits because you just you, know, you crash, you're landing in you know in source code that you know how to reason about. LLVM stuff that Hyper does, that's the hardest because you don't you land in an assembly. This thing gives you the best of both worlds. Right? You get the performance and and the the debugability. So anything any new system you're building now, you, you want to do this today. Okay. All right. Any questions? No puzzle, I guzzle cause I'm more man I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans Stacks and six packs on the table And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label No shorts with the cross, you know I got them I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it Careful with the bottle, baby, you just don't spill it Cause St. Isles is said, the paint is red You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head Take back the pack of duds You go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the studs Billy D is the chili cheese, sit down with the weak guys Be a man and get a can of St. Pie